I believe you are going to be touching on FFR submission in PMS. Yes. So um, as you all know, starting January 1, uh, 2021. Um, so now, you know, we're we're over a year into this process. Um, HHS mandated that all um, FFR submissions were uh, carried out through the payment management system. Um, we certainly are, are aware and have been um, very um, very much trying to respond to the fact that recipients have reported a significant increase in errors and challenges with submitting these reports um, via that single point of entry since the transition was implemented. Um, many of these challenges have been related to um, you know, some, some system structural validations and things that have been a little less flexible in the payment management system compared to when the submission was occurring through the ERA Commons. Um, but, you know, we certainly have put out a few guide notices related to um, the agencies providing leniency as appropriate when those challenges were preventing recipients from being able to submit their timely FFRs. Um, but the main thing we wanted to remind everybody is that if you are still experiencing any challenges with this, that you please make sure that you notify the grants management officials indicated on your notice of award um, regarding any delays and retain all documentation related to this flexibility in the event of any audit findings that may occur. Um, you know, we certainly have been encouraging recipients to reach out to um, the help desk and other um, you know, OFM and the ICs for any technical assistance that may, may need. Um, and I'm gonna outline that a little bit more on um, a later slide. So uh, for everybody's awareness as well, um, beginning March of 2021, um, NIH requested that PMS convert all of our final FFRs to interim annual FFRs in order to relax some of those validations that were preventing the submission particularly related to the federal cash transaction report. Um, now that requirement as of April um, 1 of this year, recipients are no longer required to submit that quarterly cash transaction report. And so now we should be able to see um, some of those validations being, um, some of those issues being resolved and so that recipients can, can move that forward a little bit better. Asuma, can you share on um, how recipients will be certifying their document, the disbursements now? Yeah, great question. So because um, they're no longer submitting that quarterly cash transaction report, recipients are actually going to be required to certify at the time of the drawdown request, whether the cash drawdown is for reimbursement of actual expenditures or is an advance um, for immediate disbursement. Recipients must assert that the award funds are being used in compliance with all award conditions and federal statutory requirements. And um, for NIH recipients, the grants policy statement is going to be updated at the time of its next publication to incorporate the removal of this reporting requirement. So recipients will certify um, at the time of drawdown, uh, separate from submitting the cash transaction report. And then PMS is going to pre-populate the cash transaction section of the FFR. So that's lines 10A through 10C using the recipient real-time cash expense information in PMS and um, adjust the reported disbursements to equal cash advances at the time of the drawdown. So hopefully this will minimize a lot of that burden um, particularly at the timing of annual FFRs, um, you will be able to adjust that amount if needed, but I think that this will help go a long way in helping um, our recipients as part of that FFR submission. I, I know that the grants community has had lots of questions recently about who to contact when they have FFR-related issues. I believe the next slide or so breaks down who to contact. Is that right? Absolutely. So one of the challenges, of course, that comes with this transition um, was the fact that now we recognize that recipients do have to deal with multiple systems, um, whether it's ERA or, or the PMS system in order to submit these FFRs. Um, the key things that we wanted to highlight were, were who best to, to contact when, when you run into any issues. 
So if you have any questions um, for related to the systems policy around the transition itself, you can direct that to, to me and my team at the systems policy branch. Any systems, any questions related to the ERA um, technical systems, um, please contact the ERA service desk. And what's important for recipients to recognize is that the data that is in PMS for your FFR is, with the exception of those lines 10A through 10C, are populated initially by, by ERA systems. ERA um, transmit the, transmits the data to create those FFRs to PMS. So if there's any issues with um, any of that information in that header section, like what lines one through nine, um, particularly the dates, you'll need to contact the ERA service desk first. We typically encourage recipients that if they're having any kind of technical issue, as long as it's not related to um, user roles within the payment management system, that you first reach out to ERA because then they can help troubleshoot and identify whether or not it's something that they can help resolve or if they would need to um, direct you to, to PMS. Tessima, I know another recent system process update we issued relates to requests for a drawdown outside of the liquidation period. For NIH grants, recipients have a 120-day liquidation period following the project period end date. After 120 days, PMS systems prevent automatic payment approval. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. The 120 day liquidation period is to allow time for final payments and recon reconciliation before submitting final um, financial reports. The payment management system pre um, prevents automatic approval of any payment request once that liquidation has pe period has ended for a particular document or sub account. Um, so that's the, the key thing to also keep in mind that it is at that document level. So um, that would even be between competitive segments for NIH grant awards. Great, and we do have another question, Cosma. Sure. Hi, um, I have one question. It's related to the topic. Um, I don't know, specific to everything you said. Um, we have been coming across some um, ARs that because of the two system um, and also a couple of changes regarding PMS, um, when the RPPRs are going in and uh, our PIs are saying that it's gonna be under 25% on obligated balance, there's a delay between the FFRs, the approvals, when the RPPRs are submitted. And then um, we've gotten a spike in NIH GMS inquiries to please explain why under 25% because the PMS shows that it's over 25% on obligated balance. Um, is NIH taking that into account to kind of mitigate that for administrative burden? This is just a question in general. No, that, that's a great question. So, you know, I think the, the challenge for us is, you know, our GMS, the, the, they can look in PMS, they're seeing the information that's there. Um, I think what we can encourage uh, folks to do is to just, you know, be open in that communication. Um, you know, we certainly recognize uh, that, you know, you're answering that question based off the accounting information that you have, um, but you also have to understand that because of those delays, sometimes GMS, um, they only see the information that they, they have in, in PMS as well. So, um, you know, in a lot of cases, you do have um, GMS that may follow up or verify that information, particularly if that, are, uh, that FFR hasn't been, um, if you have an annual FFR that hasn't been accepted yet by um, the central office that is reviewing them. So a lot of times, like you said, it is that timing. Um, I can't remember if the system will allow you to provide a response at that time. Um, you know, it may be encouraged to um, answer the question based off of the PMS value, but I can definitely take that back and see if it's something that maybe we can clarify in our RPPR instructions um, as to the intent of that question um, and whether or not that explanation needs to be provided so that you can sort of proactively provide that information to the, um, at the ICs before your RPPR submission. So um, I'll definitely yeah. take that down. Sorry, one thing um, definitely I could suggest for that is um, originally because it wasn't happening as often before, I was submitting like, you know, a formal letter, letterhead signed by the PI and everything, but it seems now the GMSs are understanding that this is happening more often. So um, the awarded minus expenses 
and anything upcoming that we have on our, you know, maybe invoices pending payment. And then bottom line, GMS has seemed to accept that. So okay. something basic like that, we can turn around fast. And I think that would be a great solution, uh, possibly for guidance. But yeah, that's you. very helpful. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.